we get started right now, the next portion of the program deals with probably the main area that is the first step in deciding what you do when you want to bring an action in Ontario and bring in parties from outside the jurisdiction. Dealing with this matter will be Sheila Block. Sheila's a partner at Tory Tory. She has extensive experience in this area and when I asked Master Sandler to uh, give this paper, he declined and uh, mentioned that the person that has appeared before him who's the most knowledgeable in the area is Sheila Block. So she's come highly recommended and uh, she can now take it over from here. Thank you, John. My extensive experience consisted of uh, one lengthy case before Master Sandler. But uh, both of us, I think, learned a lot in the course of that uh, case. It, was, it involved the uranium litigation from the states, and some of it had spilled up over here. And there was a battle royal with uh, a number of lawyers over service ex juris. And that's basically the foundation that I got in the area. And indeed, practitioners are increasingly finding uh, that they're faced with litigation having a foreign element, and it raises many complex questions. One aspect which is relatively easy to grasp is the, the process of service ex juris. And I want to look briefly at the position of a practitioner acting for a plaintiff contemplating suit against a foreign defendant, and then to look at the position of both the defendant and the plaintiff's counsel uh, once that process has been issued. First, from the plaintiff's point of view, Rule 25 provides a code setting out the situations in which service ex juris can be obtained. And reproduced at page 67 of the material is Rule 25, and a glance at those provisions will show you that in the vast majority of cases, it will be easy to determine <coughs> whether a fact situation fits within one of the categories. Now, from time to time, difficult questions will arise as to where a tort has been committed, uh, for instance, publication of, of a libel or spread of a slander, uh, where damage has been sustained, and I'll touch on that later, or who is a necessary and proper party. But for the most part, Rule 25 walks you through the situations in which the plaintiff can serve out of the jurisdiction. Now, a look at the legislative history of Rule 25 at first glance seems to provide fertile ground for a creative counsel uh, to construct arguments as to why process should issue automatically, because the process was changed in 1975 from the previous requirement that the plaintiff's counsel had to go before the master and get an order uh, ex parte permitting the service out. Then that was changed, and now all the plaintiff has to do is serve a notice uh, for service out, along with the rest of the statement of claim, once the lawyer determines that the plaintiff's claim comes within Rule 25. And the cases at footnote two of uh, the written text arose during the period after the amendment, when some courts, no doubt at the urging of uh, uh, inventive counsel, found that the change in procedure meant a change in the applicable principles. In this case, it was argued, it meant a change in the discretion which the court traditionally had to refuse service ex juris. But that controversy has been resolved now by the Court of Appeal and Mr. Justice Arnott's decision in the Singh case, which is cited in the paper. And his lordship held that the change in procedure did not change the substantive law and did not remove the court's discretionary power to set aside service ex juris. And I'll come to the grounds and the principles upon which one may rely in setting aside service ex juris in a moment. Regarding the new procedure since 1975, as indicated, it's all done by the plaintiff's counsel now without the necessity of a prior order of the court. And I recall having drummed into my head when I first started to practice that the writ was not to be served, just the notice of writ for service out. But even that fundamental rule has been relaxed in at least one case, which is cited in the paper, King and Co. Cot, where Mr. Justice Steele found that the, the service of the writ rather than the notice of the writ was an irregularity only and did not invalidate service in the circumstances of that case. Similarly, in BC, in the Kerry and Jones case, it was held that the failure to endorse the grounds upon which service out was based was not fatal, was not a fatal error. 
Now, I'm not recommending that you commit such technical slips, but if you follow Rule 26, you won't have to seek the already overtaxed mercy of our courts for relief from a slip. But from the plaintiff's view, getting the ball rolling is relatively straightforward. And there's even some relief for the occasional and no doubt inevitable slip. Now, once a defendant is served in the U.S., he has 40 days to appear or uh, determine whether he wishes to contest jurisdiction. Served elsewhere, he has 60 days. And I want to look at what to consider for the defendant who has been served ex juris and correspondingly what plaintiff's counsel can expect to be faced with in the way of a tax on that process. Rule 29 provides that the time limited for appearance but before appearing, um, the defendant may move to set aside service. And obviously, the first thing that you do as defense counsel before anything else is to consider whether you should defend at all. And this uh, very important consideration will be discussed, I believe, by Bill Horton. It's certainly uh, reviewed in his paper. But assuming you determine you should take some step in Ontario, you should next consider a motion to set aside the service. The most obvious ground, and the one least likely to be available, is that the plaintiff's claim does not come within uh, head of Rule 25. Most of the cases will likely come within Rule 25. But don't give up there if the case appears to come within Rule 25. There are three other broad grounds for attacking service out. One, that the service in the particular case offends the spirit of the rule. Secondly, that the defendant has a clear and complete defense which, of course, is about 90% of the cases. Third, that Ontario is not the forum convenience or a combination of those three grounds. Now, in respect of offending the spirit of the rule, the watchword here is the unjustified interference with the sovereignty of the foreign state. It has been held that notwithstanding plaintiff's compliance with Rule 25, in some cases, it is inappropriate for Ontario to assert jurisdiction out of the province. The jurisprudence here consists of older cases into which the Singh decision has breathed life. And it's really difficult to understand precisely what is meant by the, the term, the spirit of the rule, but it must be read in the context of the dicta, which one can see in the case is urging caution of, on our courts from interfering with the sovereignty of a foreign court and with foreign subjects. Justice McCurr in the Jenner case uh, indicated that service ex juris is prima facie an interference with the exclusive jurisdiction of the sovereignty of the foreign power. And this really echoes the uh, pronouncements of the English court and at page 47 of the printed material I've given you a, a quote from the English Court of Appeal in George Monroe um, and American Cyanamid, and you'll see that Lord Justice Scott in that case uh, refers to the fact that continental lawyers are appalled by the fact that the English system allows this kind of uh, long-arm jurisdiction and that as a matter of international comedy, he says, it's important that the matter be both within the letter and the spirit of, in our case, Rule 25. And he urges one to look at the realities of the case. And he says that's what the court has to look at, the realities of the case. And you'll see that these sentiments have been echoed by our courts in other quotes that I've put into the material that one has to, our courts have to proceed in a cautious manner in respect of service ex juris. It is unseemly that a command should issue from are sovereign to a subject of another state. So great care must be taken in allowing proceedings out of Ontario against foreign subjects. And to be within the spirit of the rule, in my respectful submission, it must be free from doubt that Ontario is the proper form when you look at the realities of the action. It must be appropriate to try the case in Ontario. Now, most of the questions of appropriateness resolve themselves down to this issue of forum convenience and, 
and then you take your sheet of paper and you put all the advantages for Ontario on one side and all the advantages for the other jurisdiction on the, on the other side and, and each opposing adversary will emphasize those, uh, those matters which appear to make its jurisdiction convenient. But it shouldn't be forgotten, even when arguing the forum convenience uh, route, that these general principles that have been expressed by the courts as to caution and the uh, un unseemly interference can be used as a bolster for a defendant who is, who is seeking to restrain the Ontario process from stretching its arm over a foreign subject. Now, counterbalancing that is the principle that the plaintiff, generally speaking, has the right to choose his forum. And if there is a connection with Ontario, in uh, the majority of the cases, I venture to say, the plaintiff's prima facie right to choose his forum will win. And the other factor that you must keep in mind is that this general dicta, urging caution and uh, a refusal to interfere with sovereignty, um, has had been held not to apply among the provinces within Canada themselves. Mr. Justice Hughes, in the Wismer case, uh, uh, indicated that it was, quote, quite inaccurate to talk about the sovereignty of the province of Ontario and the sovereignty of a province of Quebec. A, a vote of confidence, I guess, for the fact that we are one country and we're really not talking about the same type of sovereignty that we see in the other cases. And uh, he indicated that what he referred to as the awesome words of the Empire case and the George Monroe case would not apply in a contest between provinces within a federal state. So that caveat should be remembered. The second ground upon which, uh, in my submission, one can seek to urge that service ex jurists be set aside is the ground that the defendant has a clear and complete defense to the action. Now, anybody who's argued any uh, motions for judgment or any Rule 126 motions realizes that this is a very stiff hurdle to get to get over. There's hardly ever a case where there's a clear and complete defense and, and one uh, can assert with authority that there is no other side to the case and the plaintiff does not need his day in court. But that principle that uh, has been set out in the Societe Generale case, that a clear and complete defense will defeat service ex juris, has been extended somewhat in one case, and, and I'm afraid I've only found one, a uh, case of Mr. Justice Schrader entitled Beaver Lamb and Shearling Company and Sun Insurance, in which he went so far as to say that he wasn't satisfied that the plaintiff's claim might not be a doubtful one. So if you don't have to show clear and complete defense, but you can show it's a doubtful case, and if you plug in the judicial reluctance that I was referring to earlier about interfering with the uh, sovereign state, um, then it may be that the argument concerning the weakness of the plaintiff's case may be more favorably received in these sorts of attacks rather than uh, they usually are in any other proceedings at the outset of an action in which you're trying to get it dismissed based on a lack of merit. Now the third ground upon which uh, one can attack service ex juris and which was uh, certainly revived and given the stamp of approval by the Court of Appeal in the Singh case is that of forum convenience. It's alive and well in Ontario, but it has suffered from the fact that both uh, foreign travel and inter international trade have made the arguments that one sees in the older cases about how difficult it is to get from Alberta to Ontario um, pretty hard to, to swallow from the point of uh, view of the judiciary in determining forum convenience. So you should try and look at the recent cases as opposed to the older cases because the trade and travel that uh, have occurred in the last uh, few decades have resulted in a different attitude to the question of inconvenience. And I've given you a case in the material of Van Vogt and all Canadian group distributors because it in my view is a, a sensible approach to the whole question of forum convenience and the types of arguments one typically sees in this sort of attack. And that was a decision of the Manitoba Court of Appeal, uh, Justice Dixon as he then was. And there the plaintiff was a Manitoba resident who had been working for a Quebec company, had done all his work in Manitoba for this Quebec company and was alleging he'd been wrongfully dismissed. 
and he sued in Manitoba. The Quebec defendant argued that, um, that the civil code applied and tried to, I suppose, scare everybody that that was a completely different system of law. But Mr. Justice Dixon made it clear that the fact that the law was a foreign law in, in a true sense, a different system of law, was not relevant because it was very easy to get expert evidence on the um, law that was applicable. The other ground that was asserted was by the defendant was that there were a number of accounting records that uh, were kept in Quebec which would be relevant to the action. And as Mr. Justice Dixon said, why is it more difficult for all Canadian to take accounting records from one province to another for the purposes of trial than for countless other companies in the past? I mean, the realities of litigation are that, that uh, these documents um, travel many miles, and that was not a basis upon which convenience could be cogently argued. There's one other interesting sidelight to the Van Vocht case, and that arises because there were uh, a number of actions, and two others particularly, one by Van Vocht's brother, two brothers, and one by himself, both of which were either dismissed or stayed. And the one by this plaintiff, uh, Van Va Arthur Van Vocht, had been held to have been part of a deliberate attempt to harass the defendant by suing in Manitoba rather than Quebec, and notwithstanding that finding, and no doubt the tremendous atmospheric hurdle that it, uh, that it posed for um, Van Vock's counsel in the subsequent case, notwithstanding that, the court held that the um, that service extras would not be set aside and that this employee was entitled to sue in his jurisdiction of residence, even though he'd been found to have been using the jurisdiction as a harassment technique. So it's clear that just because you have foreign law or you have witnesses out of the uh, province or documents out of the province will not render the uh, service uh, ex juris uh, capable of being struck out. And the question of convenience is a question of fact. The onus is clearly on the defendant to show that the balance of convenience favors another form. And as you'll see in the Lummis case, which is cited, which is a decision of Master Sandler, where the, apart from the plaintiff whose head office was in Ontario, everyone else involved in the action was uh, from Pennsylvania or thereabouts, and the defendant was arguing that Pennsylvania was more convenient and there was a preponderance of convenience for that form. The Master Sandler refused the application to set aside service, saying, keeping in mind modern methods of communication and travel, I cannot find that there is an overwhelming preponderance of convenience for the state of Pennsylvania over the province of Ontario. Now, one might say this could be said in respect of almost any situation involving at least U.S. parties. And indeed, we've heard some discussion of the products liability cases, and, and I guess the discussion so far has been which one you would choose if you had the choice. But if you wish to choose Ontario for the forum, the Supreme Court of Canada has made it clear that if a foreign defendant manufactures carelessly and sends his goods into our forum, then he deserves to uh, be found to be within the jurisdiction and certainly within uh, the, that class of persons who is appropriately before the Ontario court pursuant to uh, a notice for service ex juris. Indeed, that uh, same principle was uh, applied in, in the Skyrotors case, which involved the crash of a French-made helicopter in Quebec. And in the course of that case, one of the troublesome areas of Rule 25, the question of damage sustained in Ontario, was dealt with. There had been a previous decision of Weatherston called Marr and Block, and in that case, uh, the Ontario plaintiffs had been injured in a motor vehicle accident in Saskatchewan. They'd incurred expenses in Ontario, and uh, Mr. Justice Weatherston held that they had not sustained damage in Ontario, that the accident had occur occurred in Saskatchewan, and that's where the, quote, damage was sustained. But um, that was overruled uh, by the divisional court in Weil in Von Wendt, where it was held that the legislature was trying, by putting in this clause in Rule 25 about damage sustained in Ontario, the legislature was deliberately trying to make it easier for Ontario plaintiffs to sue tort feasors for, for damage sustained in Ontario, but 
from torts committed elsewhere. The decision overruling Marin Block was also affirmed by a second panel in, of the Divisional Court in Poirier and Williston. Now, this is not all to say that, that forum convenience can never be successfully advanced uh, because the, co the court, if it's convinced that the core of the action or the center of gravity of the action is really somewhere else, will set aside the service. And I've given you a couple of cases in the paper which uh, are examples of situations where the court has found that the core of the action has been somewhere else. The uh, Cordova Land Company case and the Roger Garmetra case, uh, both of which the court uh, found uh, was focused somewhere other than Ontario, or at least the first one is an English case and the second one is an Ontario case, and found that the domestic jurisdictions were less connected with the events and the uh, resulting litigation than were the former. Now, I've also dealt briefly in the um, material with motions to stay, and this will be dis either discussed or certainly is discussed in more detail in written form in Ron Slatt's paper. But as well as moving for, to strike service ex juris, you might consider bringing a motion to stay if there are two actions brought by the same plaintiff against the same defendant for the same relief. This, unlike the motion for setting aside service ex juris, which is a master's motion, these motions are before a high court judge under sections 18 and 24 of the Judicature Act, and they're on the ground of list alibi pendants, other pending litigation. But the litigation has to be the same uh, between the same parties for the same relief. And the test is a more stringent test than on service ex juris. This whole question of appropriateness is replaced by a test of either oppressive and vexatious, which is the traditional test, and that, as we all are aware, is a, is a difficult hurdle to overcome, or as a result of recent developments in the House of Lords in uh, the Atlantic Star case in McShannon and Rockware Glass, uh, which cases Ron Slatt deals with, uh, the test may be somewhat uh, watered down to a question of whether there will be an injustice to the defendant and no injustice to the plaintiff if the stay is uh, not granted. I wouldn't dismiss, however, this whole issue of list alibi pendants because even if you think you can't meet the, the oppressive and vexatious test or you can't show that there will be an injustice, if there is other pending litigation, that is a factor to be used in your arguments to set aside service ex juris, and it's part of this issue that is dealt with by the court in dealing with forum convenience. And you'll see that uh, occurred uh, in the Roger Gramatra case where Ontario was held not to be the forum convenience because there were already four other actions. Uh, one of the reasons was there were already four other actions in Quebec. So use that Use the general principles of caution and of sovereignty. Use any list alibi pendants as supports for a cogent argument why Ontario is not the forum convenience. Because basically, you're going to need all the arguments you can get on that point, since there is a, a, a tendency to allow the plaintiff to choose, especially an Ontario resident, should have the right to, to basic right to, to sue in his own uh, province. The, other factor to look for, of course, is if there is any contractual provision between the parties where jurisdiction has been decided in advance. And uh, that, in many cases, will be very persuasive. It's not, it, it doesn't oust the jurisdiction of the court to determine that another forum is appropriate, but it will be a persuasive indicator in this question of whether the discretion of the court should be exercised in setting aside service ex juris. Now, in the paper as well, I've dealt with um, conditional appearances, which are a bit of a rare bird and one that doesn't get you very far. It means that you've lost your motion for service ex juris, striking service ex juris, and that what you're asking the court to do and what the court is permitting you to do and granting leave uh, for you to do is to raise the question of jurisdiction at trial. And this does not help because it means you've got to go through the expense and the time of prosecuting the action or having the action prosecuted against you to trial. But 
there are certain situations in which the court will require evidence of, of, at the trial before it can determine whether there is jurisdiction within Ontario, within Ontario or whether indeed it is appropriate for Ontario to exercise jurisdiction. And there are a couple of cases which are cited uh, in the written material which give you examples of the unusual situations in which that arises. Uh, just briefly, I've dealt with two other points which, um, in respect of most of the difficult points in my paper, are, are dealt with uh, more thoroughly elsewhere within the material. So I think if you read through it all from beginning to end, you'll get, the, uh, you'll get a full range. But I've dealt with the question of waiver, and that is uh, when you're retained for the defendant and are considering an attack on service extras, be very careful not to take any steps which will result in a waiver of the defendant's right to contest service. So attacks on the plaintiff's pleading, requests for particulars, motions for security for costs have all been held to amount to a waiver of the right to contest jurisdiction. In the case uh, in which I was appearing before Master Sandler, the uranium litigation case, it was argued against me, acting for the defendant, that by serving a notice under Rule 350 to get production of a contract referred to in the statement of claim, I had waived the right. Um, although the, the matter settled before uh, what no doubt would have been an authoritative judgment in the whole area was issued, uh, there was a preliminary objection and a ruling by Master Sandler that that, in the circumstances of that case, did not amount to a waiver. But it was also alleged in that case by a uh, learned counsel opposite that the mere um, request for uh, an extension of time to consider the defendant's position as to whether to move was a waiver um, of the right to a torrent. So I, uh, I didn't really fall for it, but I've been a little gun shy ever since in terms of exactly what I do in these situations. I think you've got to take great care in what steps you take before you bring your motion, uh, lest, it, that it, lest it be turned around against you and you lose substantive rights for your client. The other uh, matter which is dealt with in the written material is the question of atonement, and it's similar to waiver. It, um, it raises the question of whether the mere fact that you bring your application for service ex juris results in an atonement to the jurisdiction. Your application to strike service is, in effect, a statement where you say you do not have jurisdiction, Ontario. Yet, if you lose that motion, the question is, ha have you atoned from the, from the point of view of, uh, of, of leaving the action, not doing anything else, and then default judgment issuing against your defendant, will that judgment be enforceable in your defendant's jurisdiction, where, uh, the jurisdiction where he has assets, because he had atoned to the jurisdiction, and the cases of Harrison Taylor and Henry and Giapresco, which are dealt with in, in, uh, in Bill Graham's paper and in, um, in Bill Horton's paper, uh, have lent support to that theory in England. There's been adverse criticism of Henry and Giapresco in uh, the literature and in our own Court of Appeal, which has said in the McCain Foods case that um, that uh, it does not consider itself bound by Henry and Giopresco at this stage, and it will reserve to another day the consideration of it. But until that is resolved, there's certainly a great risk in bringing your application for uh, a motion to strike out service ex juris, and you should be mindful of that reasoning in Henry and Giopresco and ensure that your clients are getting advice in respect of the fori in which they have assets, because if the Henry and Giopresco theory applies in England, or if it applies in a jurisdiction in which your client has assets, then what you do in your motion in Ontario will have an ad may well have an adverse effect, and it may be that you will want to, that you'll want to consider with your client's foreign advisors not to take any steps at all in Ontario, so that the default judgment will be a truly default judgment without any atonement whatsoever. Thank you.